get started with a little bit of background on what exactly Turner syndrome is. So Turner syndrome is a collection of phenotypes that include short stature, infertility, as well as some cardiac complications, and that's just a shorter list. Um, this collection of phenotypes was actually later associated with um, the missing second sex chromosome. So these women who have Turner syndrome, instead of being 46XX, um, like a normal woman, or 46XY, like a male, they're actually 45X. Um, so it affects about one in every 2,000 women. It's 99% lethality, which means that 99% of fetuses that have Turner syndrome don't make it full term. But um, there, is a, uh, there is something called mosaic Turner syndrome, which basically means that instead of all of the cells being affected, only some of them are affected, and the other ones can be normal, or some other variation. Um, so you can kind of see that on the right side of um, this slide, where you have that picture of some of the cells being affected, and that translates in to, in the body, different tissues are affected in different ways. Um, so in general, we see that these mosaic Turner syndrome patients do have increased viability. So I talked about that 99%. It's definitely lower for mosaic Turner syndrome patients. They tend to fare better and make it full term longer. Also, it's a milder phenotype. They see less of the actual symptoms that I discussed earlier in the presentation. Um, so just to recap, that left side is just a karyotype analysis of someone with Turner syndrome. So that shows 45 chromosomes instead of 46. Um, so that's what um, Turner syndrome is. As you can imagine, that loss of one sex chromosome affects multiple genes at once. Um, so for clarity, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what TS candidate genes are. Um, so these, what I'm going to call candidate genes, are genes that are located on the X chromosome, the Y chromosome, or the region that's common to both and known as the pseudoautosomal region, or PAR. Um, these are the genes that we're interested in in this study, specifically because, think about it, these are the genes that Turner syndrome patients aren't getting a double dosage of because they're missing that second sex chromosome. Um, so that brings me to my hypothesis. I hypothesize that a precise dosage of certain genes on the sex chromosomes is necessary for uh, certain tissues for viable human development. Um, so essentially what this really means is that mosaicism is the deal for every Turner syndrome patient. Complete 45X Turner syndrome really can't exist. Um, and the reason for that was just because we predicted that there were some t uh, tissues that were going to require two sex chromosomes. Um, so that brings me to kind of my first part of the method. So um, I have two specific aims. The first one was uh, to optimize probes for the FISH protocol. So FISH is a hybridization technique. It stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. Um, and so basically what the goal is is to identify certain sequences um, using uh, fluorescent tags basically that are on other sequences that can bind on um, and find areas that you're looking for. Um, so in this study, we wanted to come up with an actual protocol for fish that worked that I could follow um, and use on human, uh, human tissue. But the, also the goal was to actually figure out the probes that were going to work for us. Um, so we needed an X probe, a Y probe, and a, um, for an autosomal control, a chromosome 7 probe. And the end goal of this analysis was to come up um, with, the ba with a way to basically um, look at TS embryos. And if we were consistently finding two sex chromosomes, in some tissue of TS embryos, and even despite the fact that they're TS and should only have one of the sex chromosomes, that's probably convincing evidence um, that you really do need double dosage in those uh, in that specific tissue. Um, so what I do want to do is take a minute to point out what I have pictured on these slides. Um, up on the top here, you see that we have. Um, this kind of just shows the probes that we were using. So that's for the Y probe. Um, it's showing that the Y probe specifically uh, binds only to the Y chromosome. So here, all of the blue marks are chromosomes, and the Y is only binding over here um, in the colored region. That's the probe. Same thing for the X on the bottom. So now getting to my actual results of the FISH analysis. Um, so the first thing that we did was actually practice all of this protocol on uh, mouse tissue. Reason just being because human tissue um, is more valuable. We didn't want to get straight to it. So this entire analysis that I have shown here with the probe, really the point was just to make sure that the protocol was working. Um, we did find that it was working. As you can see in this top right picture, um, there's one spot of fluorescence in each of those nuclei that are marked by DAPI. Um, and 
that, that's what you'd expect. Uh, as it says, that was the Y chromosome probe on the male mouse. Uh, males have one Y chromosome, so that's not unexpected there. Um, and then we have the Y chromosome probe on the female mouse as a biological control on the left side of the screen. Um, on that, we don't see really any spots of fluorescent because females don't have Y chromosomes. And then bottom right is just no probe. Wouldn't expect any fluorescence. There's nothing fluorescently tagged to actually bind onto sequences since there's no probe. Um, so at that point, we were pretty confident that our Y probe was working on the mouse tissue. So now we're, re uh, and we knew that our protocol was working um, since we got those results. So we were ready to move on to the human embryo tissue. We found that the human embryo tissue, um, we, we were able to perform fish on it successfully using the X chromosome probe. Um, so here on the, uh, most left, I have just a diagram of the probe. So the X chromosome probe we used um, was what's called a centromere probe. It binded onto a sequence on the X chromosome that was um, close to the centromere because it's stable over time. Um, but the pictures that I have of the actual microscopic um, imaging, um, here on the most left, you can see that the X chromosome, there's one spot of fluorescence in each one of these nuclei, and that's a male mouse, so you'd expect one X chromosome. On this, and it is a little bit hard to see um, given the lighting and uh, actually the way the imaging worked, but um, here you can see that there are two spots of fluorescent in this nuclei, two in this one, um, so that's, that's because there are two X chromosomes in female, and that's a female mouse. Then right side is just no fluorescence because that was a no probe control. So we have the X chromosome probe working. We weren't able to optimize the Y probe or the chromosome 7 probe, so in order to actually do our uh, survey of mosaicism, we would need to figure those out in future research. Um, but that brings me to my specific aim number two, which was to analyze expression of TS genes in tissues and assess deviations in Turner syndrome. Um, so basically, I had a lot of RNA-seq analysis data, like expression data, um, and I had them for various different samples, but mostly I'm just going to talk about the embryos, because that's what um, I'll be reviewing in the graphs coming up. So I wanted to look at um, gene expression throughout embryonic development, just not even in Turner syndrome patients, just normal patients without Turner syndrome, but looking at those TS candidate genes we discussed. Um, so, and then the second part of that was actually using quantitative polymerase chain reaction in order to truly actually analyze Turner syndrome samples and look at some relative expression of these TS candidate genes. Um, so the first set of results that we have for the RNA-seq analysis shows that um, these genes, RPS4X, TMSB4X, DDX3X, and EIF1AX, are highly expressed in early human embryos. So you can see those. Those are the ones that I have the arrows drawn to here. Um, the heat maps show that they're pretty dark, highly expressed throughout all of embryonic development. And these are just X chromosome genes. So now we're going to move on to the Y. Um, we have, again, some genes, RPS4Y1, DDX3Y, and EIF1AY that are highly expressed. Um, but one major difference you probably notice is that they don't start becoming expressed until a lot later on, um, precisely around eight cell stage. And there is a reason for that. Um, between four cell and eight cell is when zygote genome activation occurs. Um, so that's when the embryo no longer is transcribing the maternal RNA. It's making its own RNA. Um, so prior to that, when it is transcribing its maternal RNA, RNA, it's obviously not going to express Y chromosome genes considering the mother doesn't have a Y chromosome. Um, also here what you see is that there's a sample that doesn't seem to have any expression, so um, that's likely just a female sample. Unfortunately, we didn't have sex on these samples, so um, we are seeing some Y expression, so we know that at least some of them are male, um, but we don't know the exact breakdown. Lastly, we have these PAR region genes, SLC25A6 and CD99, um, expressed highly throughout embryonic development. But then we have this different group of genes, ACAP17A and ASMTL, that are highly expressed um, towards the end, but don't become, don't, um, become to be expressed until the eight cell stage. Um, and then my qPCR results show that the 45x samples do express genes less than the 46xx samples. Um, so we had established with RNA seq analysis that these patients uh, that in general, we do see gene expression of candidate genes in the normal population, and through this, we've established that it's lesser in Turner syndrome samples, which could contribute to the phenotype. Um, so conclusions, we were able to make progress on that FISH protocol through the X probe, but we need some work on the Y probe and the chromosome 7 probe in order to survey mosaicism. We were able to identify TS candidate genes and look at their expression, um, but we want to do that in more Turner syndrome samples in the future, and we looked at qPCR to compare relative expression. Um, so just some significance. Um, 
and what this actually means to the medical community and Turner syndrome patients. Uh, surveying mosaicism is critical to understanding the TS phenotype, which up to now is still pretty mysterious. Um, there's a lot of unpredictability. Um, also, now that we found those actual gene expression data, we can target gene therapy um, and maybe even look at some protein replacement. And some of the information can be valuable in terms of uh, other chromosomal conditions. Uh, I want to thank the CEE, RSI, MIT, my tutor, Deborah, my mentors from the Whitehead Institute, um, and my sponsor at the DOD. So, oh, I have my microphone. Um, so, through amniocentesis, you can, um, prior to, like, you can diagnose Turner syndrome as a fetus, and then, I mean, you're going to know if they end up dying before full birth. Is, is mosaicism in non-Turners occur 1% of the time as well? Um, oh, yeah. Um, so the question was, does mosaicism in non-Turners occur 1% of the time as well? Um, so actually, mosaicism, even in Turner syndrome, doesn't occur 1% of the time. 1% are viable, so you said Yeah. Um, so what we're saying is that 99% right now of complete 45X, what are diagnosed as complete 45X, and when I say that, I mean that a karyotype analysis is showing them at 45X, but they might actually not be, which is our theory that even they are mosaic. Um, we're saying that 99% of those patients end up, end up dying preterm, or I shouldn't call them patients, fetuses end up dying before birth. Um, mosaicism in general is actually about 50% of the population, 50% of the Turner syndrome um, population, and those tend to just have better um, stats and viability. Um, is there a degree of mosaicism that's considered viable uh, for Turner syndrome, and is it tissue dependent? And how does, so you're asking a very tough question in, in the, the question of are, are all Turner syndromes mosaic? Because you're asking like a non existence per question. So you, you can never possibly study every cell of the body. So what sort of threshold are you looking for and what sort of data, if you were to get your probes working, mm -hmm. how much data would you need to look at to actually answer your question? Yeah, so that's, that's a phenomenal question. So um, to answer, so the first part of the question was um, talking about like what is our threshold for mosaicism? What percent are we gonna call it mosaic and call it complete at? Um, right now, the general trend is if there's any normal cell, then you're mosaic. Um, so there are people who are 10% mosaic, um, and you will actually get a number popped out like that from a karyotype analysis. Um, given that, um, you do see like a general trend of increasing. So if you are 90% normal cells, 10% um, Turner syndrome cells, you're probably better off than someone who's 70% uh, normal, 30% Turner cells. Um, so that mosaicism kind of spectrum does exist. Um, in terms of how we can actually prove this hypothesis, uh, you're completely right about um, you probably never get to, I mean, hypothetically, there could always be an embryo out there that is alive and is complete Turner that you just didn't find. Um, but there really hasn't been any analysis on like any set of embryos right now. So even if we're able to make progress in the right direction of just analyzing 30 embryos, which was the end goal in this project, and if we're able to find that all 30 of these embryos that were complete 45, that were diagnosed as complete 45X, they genuinely do have two sex chromosomes in some of their cells, then that's progress towards the hypothesis, even if it's not like 100% definitive. Something extremely basic that I thought I learned in medical school 35 years ago, and maybe it's just wrong. But what I learned was every female on the planet is a mosaic due to the phenomenon of X chromosome inactivation. So, so every single cell in, the, in a human female's body starts out as 46XX, but ends up as 45XX. Or 45X, yeah. sorry. And it's random whether the maternal or the paternal X is inactivated. Mm -hmm. Is that that's still true? Yes. So, so, so I guess my question then is, is your, is your research question that someone who starts out as 45X due to X chromosome inactivation in a certain proportion of the cells will be 44 no X or Y, and some will be normal 45X as if due to normal X chromosome yeah. inactivation? So the question is basically in terms of, um, we all know about X inactivation. So, um, 
even a normal woman who is 46XX is really only using the 45X, that second X chromosome shouldn't matter, why are we seeing this TS phenotype in the first place? Um, so, the, and then the second part of the question is, um, clarifying what TS means, uh, you asked about if 45X is genuinely like 44X and you still see that inactivation. Um, the answer is that no. So part of that second X chromosome, while most of it is inactive, not all of it is. Some of those genes do escape inactive, X inactivation. In a, normal situation. in a normal situation, yes, for a normal woman. Now, these patients with Turner syndrome who simply just don't have that X, they miss those genes that are escaping X inactivation normally. Um, so that, and that's a lot of the fertility-related genes specifically. Um, so that's why um, we have so many fertility problems. It's something crazy like, um, it's pretty much a death sentence for a Turner Syndrome woman to try to um, have a baby normally um, without Turner Remind me, at what stage does X chromosome inactivation normally occur? Oh. Uh -huh. And, and does, a, does the Turner Syndrome fetus with only one X chromosome, does that get randomly inactivated in half the cells and not inactivated in the other half? Mm -hmm. Um, so there are two, so the, the question, the first question was what stage does X chromosome inactivation occur? The second uh, question was kind of about the etiology of Turner syndrome and when that loss of the second X chromosome happens. Um, so in terms of the second question, etiology wise, so there's two different theories as to how Turner syndrome can arise. Um, actually, this picture is a good description of one of them. So it's it's the idea, the one on the right. Um, it could be either postmeiotic or premeiotic. Um, if, if there's this theory that it's actual non-disjunction, we just don't have the two chromosomes ever coming together to form a Turner syndrome baby. Um, in that case, we wouldn't see mosaicism, though, because we wouldn't have any normal cells. Um, so the more likely theory is that uh, everything happens together at, fine at conception, and then later on, something while those cells are duplicating goes wrong. Um, so that would be pretty late on in embryonic development, because it would be like after zygote and everything. Um, but in terms of your first question, X chromosome inactivation, I'm not sure exactly um, when that occurs, but I'd assume that it's somewhere similar to where the, like, I'd assume it'd have to be after zygote genome activation, which happens between four cell and eight cell. Any other questions from the judges? You have time for what? Okay, yeah. So, so I wasn't understanding. So when you're saying mosaic, you mean mosaic loss of X, not mosaic two cells from different concepti. No, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so the that. question is uh, like just a kind of clarification on mosaicism. So what I'm saying is mosaicism is when some of your cells are 46XX, we'll just keep it simple for now, and some are 45X. But all the other chromosomes are identical. But all the other, yeah. yeah. Because there are people that are mosaic the other way, but there's mm -hmm. two embryos mixed together. Yeah. yeah. So this is the... And mosaicism can actually have um, some different type of things going on as well, where that second, that the normal cells might not actually be normal. They, not, they might not be 46XX. There can be like ring structures going on chromosomally as well, um, which can kind of have their very own phenotype. But um, there's a lot of variation. So mosaicism is definitely a gold mine in terms of Turner syndrome research. Thank you. Uh, so